special welcome to those of you who are new with us this morning. We are glad to have you with us. If you would, sometime today, grab one of these cards that should be in the seat back in front of you, or if you're in the balcony, you can scan the QR code in your bulletin. Fill out the information there. You can drop it in the offering boxes on the way out, and let us get to know you a little better and have a record of your visit. This morning, we have much to celebrate. One, we are celebrating the peace that we have with God because of the coming of His Son. We're also celebrating uh, a new brother in Christ who has come to place his trust in the Lord. We're also celebrating uh, a family from our church who is going out to the nation. So it is a very special morning this morning. And with that in mind, I ask that you would direct your attention to the screens. Gideon, I'm so glad that you're here today to share with the church about your desire to be baptized. Uh, we want to ask you just a few questions. So can you tell me, uh, how is it that you came to salvation? I grew up in a Christian home going to church, and I've always been taught about God. I had several conversations with my mom about what it means to be saved. I believe God's word says we're sinners, but we can be saved by turning away from our old life of sin and believing that Jesus was perfect and died on the cross to save me. Well, how is your life different now that you're following Jesus? I started to obey more and be more helpful and apologize when I do something wrong and work for peace instead of strife or what would benefit me the most. Is there anyone in your life who has been especially helpful in you coming to faith in Christ? I feel like my parents and pastors have helped me to understand the depth of salvation and my life group leaders have helped to shape me as a Christian. Well, tell me, why do you desire to be baptized today? I've been a follower of Christ for a while, but I haven't been baptized yet. I want to obey what Jesus says, so I'm following him in baptism today. Amen. We're glad that you're joining with us in baptism today. Gideon comes to be baptized this morning. If you are part of Gideon's family or close friends, would you stand this morning? If you are part of his life group or you've been one of his teachers, please stand. And then the rest of the church, please stand. Gideon, who are you trusting in as Lord of your life? Jesus. Gideon, based on your confession of Christ as Lord, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
On this second Sunday of Advent, as we anticipate the coming of Jesus Christ, we light the candle of peace. Although we know that universal peace is impossible until the kingdom of God is fully realized in the age to come, it is possible for us to know and experience the peace that surpasses all understanding in our hearts and lives. The peace of God is only possible if we have peace with God through saving faith in Jesus, the Prince of Peace. As the candle of peace is lit, hear God's promises of peace through the prophet Micah and the apostle Paul. Micah 5, 4 through 5. And he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall dwell secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be their peace. Romans 5, 1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ.
Please take your order of worship. Let us read together. Our New Testament reading this morning comes from the beginning verses of the book of Mark. I will read what is in light if you respond by reading what is in bold. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, We're now going to have a time of confession in which there in the silence of your own heart, I ask you to confess your sins before God, and then I will lead us in a prayer together. Let us pray. God of heaven, we confess to you that we were born in sin. Our hearts are corrupted, desiring evil and selfish things. And these desires of our hearts have worked themselves out through the transgressions of our hands, transgression of your holy law. Things that we know were wrong, and we have your Holy Spirit that that prompts us and prods us towards right, yet we've transgressed anyhow. And this breaking of your law has led to enmity between you and us, and rightly so. Our sins have made a separation between us. And then there's Jesus. He who came to bring peace on earth, goodwill toward those with whom you are pleased, through Jesus, you look at us not with disgust, but with pleasure and goodwill. Because of Jesus, there is peace. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for him. We are grateful for the peace with you that we have through him. And it is in his name, in Jesus' name, that we pray. Amen. We're now going to read an assurance of pardon together. Ours comes from Psalm 85, verses 8 and 9. Um, we have a former member of this church who wrote me uh, before a Sunday morning one time and said, I don't know why we don't scream the assurance of pardon every morning. If we truly have been pardoned of our sin, this should come with full vigor and full-throated cries. And he was right. This morning, as we read of the assurance of pardon that we have in Christ, let's do it like we mean it. Psalm 85, 8 and 9. Let me hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people, to his saints, but let them not turn back to folly. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him, that glory may dwell in him.
Then also Acts chapter 13. We're going to read verses 1 through 3 there. So start in Matthew 1. Do your Bible drills and turn quickly over to Acts 13, verse 1. Beginning with Matthew 1 1. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And then Acts 13. Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who is called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaen, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. Let's pray. Our great and glorious Lord, we come to you this morning in thanksgiving for all that you have done, recognizing your goodness, your grace, your mercy. We thank you, God, for this morning where we can come, where we can sing your praises, where we can celebrate baptism, where one has declared Christ is Lord and committing himself to follow after you, where we can read your word that you have given to us, where we can come and celebrate the coming of Jesus Christ, the Savior. Lord, may it be this morning that we would see Christ all the more clearly, that our Savior would be exalted. And I pray, God, that you would move by your Spirit through your Word for your glory in this time. In the preaching of the Word, may Christ be lifted high. May the Spirit work in the hearts of those who are here and those who watch by video. I pray, God, for transformation of life by your Spirit through the Word. I pray, God, for those who have never turned to Christ, that this morning they would believe. And I pray, God, 
that is a result of our time this morning, that every single one of us would have a greater passion for the glory of Christ to the ends of the earth. We pray in his name. Amen. You may be seated. So this morning, we come to two passages that don't seem to have a lot to do with Christmas. Because here we are, 15 days, if you're doing your countdown, 15 days from Christmas, and we have everything here decorated for Christmas. You've probably been doing your Christmas shopping unless you're a procrastinator like me. And tonight, we have the choir presentation uh, that Pastor Zach has been working diligently on. I have snuck in and watched him directing with his passion and fervor uh, on some Wednesday nights. And, and so you will, this is my pitch for you, you will absolutely want to be here tonight uh, as we have the choir presentation because it's all going to be focused on the coming of Christ, which is why we are here in this season to focus on and remember the birth of Jesus Christ. And then this morning, your preacher reads a genealogy and an account about Saul and Barnabas being set apart for mission. Now, in case you're worried, next week we will be in passages that are clearly Advent-related. But there are two specific reasons that we are coming to these passages together this morning. First is we are commissioning two of our church members for mission. We should not dare not come at this lightly. It represents God calling out this couple and sending them to a far-off place for his namesake in reaching the nations. This is huge for us as a congregation. The second reason is I want to contend to you this morning that Christmas leads to mission. I want to make the case for you as clearly as I can from these two passages that Christmas must necessarily lead to mission for the, for the fame of Jesus Christ to the ends of the earth. This is primarily going to be our focus together this morning. And so we're going to start with that verse in Matthew 1.1. 1, 1. And so let me read that little verse to you once again. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Now, there have been a few times since I've been here that we've dealt a little bit with genealogies, and I've explained to you that I understand. I know that genealogies aren't your most exciting thing that you come to when you do your Bible reading. I know the glazed over eyes that we tend to get when it comes to those genealogies, but if you've been here over this past year, you've heard me a couple times say to you that these genealogies are absolutely important. And I want to contend even more for this verse, that this verse is incredibly important for our understanding of what Matthew is doing. Now, I read it to you in our English translation. This morning, I'm going to read a couple of words of it from the Greek translation because you're smart folks, and I know that you can get this, all right? So here is how that starts in the Greek. Biblos geneseos. Biblos geneseos, all right? So let's start with that first word, biblos, now, let me put it in a little bit more Americanized version, Biblos, all right? You can hear what that refers to, right? It's where we get the word Bible. And in the Greek, it just simply means book. Now, that second word, Geneseos, all right? Let me make it a little bit more Americanized for us. Geneseos, Genesis. It's where we get the word Genesis, and you can hear that. And so, in the Greek version of the Old Testament, it's called the Septuagint, we find this exact phrase a couple of times, and it's kind of in genealogy sections. 
Uh, the first one is in Genesis 2, 4. Biblos, Geneseos, of the heavens and the earth when they were created. This is the account of the genealogy of the record of the heavens and the earth when they were created. And then in Genesis 5, 1. Biblos, Geneseos, of Adam. This is the book or the genealogy of Adam, and then after that, it gives all this genealogy that comes from Adam. Now, this doesn't sound overly exciting to you, I know, but if you were a Jewish person during this time period and you read this in Matthew, there would be immediate alarm bells that are going off in your mind, and you would say, I know that. I recognize that. I've heard that before. And you would immediately think back to Genesis. And you would know that Matthew is doing something, connecting this back to Genesis for us so that we're going to be thinking back all the way back to the beginning. And so what's Matthew doing then in this book of the genealogy? Well, Matthew tells us what he's doing. Uh, He says, this is how it happened that the Messiah came. This is the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Now, the word Christ in the Greek is simply the, uh, the Greek equivalent of the word for Messiah. Now, when a Jewish person would have heard this, this is the account, this is the record of uh, the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, it would have caused them to move into this state of absolute thankfulness and excitement because they had been looking for the Messiah, looking for the Redeemer for hundreds of years, the one who had come and rescued them. And so when they read these first words of Matthew, it would have caused joy and excitement for them because they had been looking forward to the coming of Jesus. But then we get to a couple of statements there in that verse that might not immediately make sense. So this is something of a summary of the rest of the genealogy. It says, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, but then it doesn't go into the first person in the genealogy and just go in order. It goes, the son of David, and then the son of Abraham. What is Matthew doing here by noting these to people. Well, David makes sense to us. David was the greatest king uh, of Old Testament Israel. And so if we're thinking about a Messiah, he is the king of kings. And so it would make sense to put David right there. This is the one who has come to reign over everything and put all things under his feet. But why Abraham? Why is it that Abraham would be listed here? Now, we first might think, well, he's the first patriarch. He's the one that God called out. And of course, that is certainly part of the reason. But I think there is something more to it about why Abraham is mentioned here. And it goes along with the first promise that God makes to Abraham. God tells him in Genesis chapter 12 that he is going to bless all of the families of the earth through Abraham. And when this promise is repeated in Genesis 18 and Genesis 22, the word that's used there in the Greek version of this is nations, emphasizing that through Abraham, all the nations of the world are going to be blessed. So why is it that Matthew is specifically putting Abraham here in this summary? Because his point is is that Jesus This Messiah is coming to fulfill that promise that was made to Abraham that through his genealogy, all of the nations of the world are going to be blessed. And this is something that is written all over Scripture, that God's purpose was not just for one people, but for all peoples, for the good news of Jesus Christ to go to the ends of the earth. And we see this all over the Old Testament. When we look at the Psalms, it is written over and over and over again. I have hanging in my office a page, a leaf, uh, from a 1549 Bible. Uh, It's called the uh, Matthews Bible. Uh, And so this particular Bible was based on a translation uh, of William Tyndale, 
You've probably heard his name. You remember him. He was involved in translating the Bible into English. And because of that, uh, he was put to death for simply translating the Word of God into the language of the people, 1536. 1537, a, a different man by the name of John Rogers began working with Tyndale's translation. He focused especially on translating the Hebrew Old Testament into English. And so in 1537, uh, he and another guy published what's called the Matthews Bible. And the reason that it's called Matthews Bible is because he used a pseudonym, Thomas Matthew. And I think it's a pretty clear reason because the guy who worked on translation before uh, ended up being killed for it. Uh, But actually, uh, this guy, John Rogers, he ended up uh, being put to death also a few years later. And, And so this leaf that I have hanging on my wall in my office is from that 1549 uh, Matthew's Bible, and it's a leaf of Psalm 67, my favorite psalm in all the book of the Psalms. Psalm 67, verses 3 and 4 says, let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the nations praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. It's a psalm that declares what God's purpose is for all peoples of the world, and that they would have joy in him. It's declared everywhere. Psalm 105.1, oh, give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make known his deeds among the peoples. Isaiah declares this, Isaiah 52.10, the Lord has bared his holy arm before the eyes of all the nations. All the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of of our God. And we can multiply passage after passage that declares this truth. And so when we come to Matthew then, Matthew 1.1, he's making it clear to us that Jesus' purpose in coming is for reaching the nations because he begins with this allusion to, uh, to Abraham and God blessing all the world through Abraham. And then the very end of the book, The first words that Jesus declares to all the disciples and the last words that we have uh, of Matthew is Jesus saying, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. So Matthew begins with this allusion, this reference to God blessing all the nations, and then we come to the end of it, and it's about going to the nations. And so to make this even clearer then, when we come to Acts chapter 1 and Jesus is getting ready to ascend to go to the Father, Jesus tells him the last words to the disciples is that you will be my witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, to the ends of the earth. The mission of Jesus is global in scope. And so I've heard it said that standing behind the manger, standing behind the cradle, was always the cross. But I think we could take that even a step further. If we have the cross standing always behind the cradle, always behind the cross is the mission of Jesus a global mission that goes to all the nations of the earth. And so it absolutely must be the case. If Jesus came for the sake of reaching the nations, it must be that the purpose of Christmas then leads us to mission. Now, we turn then to Acts chapter 13. I want to show you how this connects to what we have been saying about Christmas and mission. So flip back over there to Acts chapter 13, verses 1 through 3. And so what we're going to do is we're going to just start with uh, the context, setting it in its proper uh, place here. Uh, And so if you remember, uh, there's something that I've been training you in over this past year. Now, there are three rules to interpreting the Bible. Do you remember what they are? Context, context, context. So we want to set this in context to understand what's taking place here. Uh, And so after Jesus rose... Uh, We have Pentecost. We have all these people who are saved. Uh, We get this instruction to go to the ends of the earth, but disciples and most of the believers are staying there in Jerusalem. And they stay there uh, until there's a certain event that happens. 
And you might remember what that event was. It's the martyrdom of Stephen. There's this great persecution that breaks out, and many of the people are scattered. And as people are scattered, the gospel begins to spread from Jerusalem to other areas. And we start seeing Gentiles come to faith in Christ. And so where we are here is in Antioch. Uh, It's a few hundred miles north of Jerusalem. So in that amount of time, the gospels advanced a pretty far distance as people are going uh, throughout that region. And as they're going, they're sharing the good news of Christ. And so in this church, it lists some people here. Many of them we don't know who we are. These are prophets, they're teachers, leaders within the church. Uh, But there's a pretty interesting detail about one of them here. Uh, It mentions Manaean, a lifelong friend of, did you notice here, Herod the Tetrarch. Uh, That's the Herod who uh, ruled in this area, and it's the same Herod who was involved in the beheading of John the Baptist. And, And so the gospel has gotten even to the point of some of Herod's lifelong friends have heard the good news of Jesus and have turned to Christ and even functioning in some kind of teaching and leadership role within this church. But there are a couple people who are especially important within this. It's Barnabas and Saul. And we know Saul most uh, in this because Saul was Paul, uh, the apostle to the Gentiles. And so he's the, the one who we read most about in the book of Acts. And so what do we see happening here? We see the Holy Spirit setting apart Barnabas and Saul for the mission that God was leading them to, a mission that was taking the gospel to the Gentiles, taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. And as this happens, I want you to notice what the church is doing when the Spirit moves, calls them out, and for the church to set them apart. In verse 2, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit spoke. Worship is one of the most fundamental purposes of the church. We gather every Sunday for this time of corporate worship where we fellowship together around the Word singing the praises of Jesus. Now, I appreciate um, how Pastor Douglas shared about how we could, should speak the, um, the assurance of pardon loudly. I would say the very same thing when it comes to singing, this one aspect, part of the aspect of worship, is that we are a people, if you're a believer, you have been brought from death and sin to being alive in Christ We should be a people who are willing to belt out the praises of Jesus. I don't care if your singing sounds like a dying cat. It is a beautiful, joyful noise when we are gathered together singing the praises of Jesus. It is part of the purpose of why God has saved us for his eternal worship. And what we do here on a Sunday morning is just a picture of what we'll do forever and eternity. And so if you're not singing now, you're going to one day when you're before the throne of Jesus Christ. So you might as well start practicing really well right now. Worship is part of who we are. But then it also says here that they were fasting. Fasting is a means of going without the physical sustenance of life, in order that we might seek after the one who is greater than life itself. And so undoubtedly, as they're worshiping, they're seeking the face of the Lord by fasting, and prayer undoubtedly incorporated along with that. And then as they're doing that, the Spirit moves for setting apart Saul and Barnabas. I think there is something here to be said about how God worked as his people were worshiping, fasting, seeking his face. When we look throughout church history, there is a commonality of the way that God works and moves, particularly in these major uh, revivals that the Spirit causes. Every single time throughout history, 
a revival, this movement of God's spirit among God's people is preceded by the prayers of God's people, always. A guy by the name of N. Murray uh, wrote a book on some of the major revivals that happened here in the United States, and he gave particular attention to the role of prayer in it. He said that true prayer is bound up with a persuasion of our inability and our completed dependence on, complete dependence on God. And so there were people who were praying, remembering and recognizing that if anything would happen, it would be entirely dependent on God doing it, not on them manufacturing it. They needed the Lord. And so there was this great spirit of prayer that was happening. And so he writes about the, the prayer that happened before the great awakening of the early 1800s. And he said, one thing that can be said with certainty about the 1790s is that there was a growing concern among Christians to pray. Later on, when the evidence of records from those years was compared, it was recognized that across the Union from Connecticut to Kentucky, the 1790s were marked by a new spirit of intercession, of prayer to the Lord. It is so often the case that the earnest, seeking, convictional prayers of God's people, the fasting of God's people, precedes the gracious outpouring of the Spirit of God for the glory of God. And that's exactly what we see happening here in Acts. There are people who are worshiping the Lord, and they are diligently seeking the face of the Lord as they fast and as they pray, and then the Spirit stirs among them for setting aside Saul and Barnabas for the work of mission that God had given them. Now, I think there is something that we can see here in our own church about how God has worked in response to the prayers of his people. So over about the past six years or so, we have sent out six adults to the mission field that we have commissioned as a church. This, I'm convinced, is a result of the prayers of God's people in this congregation. And so if you remember, uh, for the past quite a few years, uh, this church prayed at 10.02 every day that God would raise up people to go to the field. It's a reference to Luke 10, 2, uh, where Jesus said that the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Pray, therefore, for the Lord of the harvest to send out more workers. And so in those years, this church has sent out six adults with some kids as part of the family there. And then today, we are commissioning, we're sending out two more. And it's why we are going to continue prioritizing prayer as a congregation. If you were here on October the 29th, you heard me lay out quite a few things about some strategic planning for this church that we called Toward 200. Uh, looking ahead to our 200th anniversary that's going to come in, eight, in a ni- 2037, what year am I in? Uh, it's going to be coming in 2037 because we were uh, formed as a, uh, a church 200 years before that. And so we're thinking about all these different things that we as a church need to give ourselves to. And the very first point that we referenced was prayer. Because we are under the conviction that prayer is paramount. That God works through the prayers of his people. And so coming in January, we're going to unroll just a little bit of that. A little bit of of some of the prayer emphasis that we're going to have. And we're going to be encouraging the church toward prayer, especially prayer before Sunday mornings, and then prayer for different parts of our church. And then one of the things that we are going to encourage our congregation in is not just prayer, but also fasting. Now, one of the things that we are good at as Baptists is feasting. We do that exceptionally well. What we don't do well is fasting. But Jesus spoke as if fasting was an expectation, was a norm. Not that fasting was the exception. And so we will actually be encouraging our congregation to fast 
as we seek the face of the Lord. We worship, we'll pray, we'll fast together, and ask that the Lord would work for his glory among us and then through us. And so as they're fasting, worshiping, and praying, God calls out Saul and Barnabas, and we have to ask the question, why is it that the Spirit would do that? Why would the Spirit set aside these two men? It's because of what we already said about God's purpose. God's purpose is global in scope. His purpose is to redeem people from every tribe and tongue and nation. And so the coming of Christ must lead beyond the cradle to the cross and then to the ends of the earth. So it makes complete sense that the Spirit would then call out people to go to the ends of the earth. And so this morning, when we have the commissioning service a little bit later in the service, what we're doing is we're recognizing that God has called out a couple of our members. And then we are setting them apart. And Douglas is going to lead us in how we can support them through in prayer and encouraging them. Because we know that God's purpose is for his glory to be known to the ends of the earth. Let's bring this back to you and me. We don't need this to be simply a message where you hear something about mission again. If Christmas leads to the cross and then to mission, that means that every single Christian has a responsibility in some way for mission. If you are a follower of Christ, you have incumbent on you in some way the gospel getting to the ends of the earth. So we all, as followers of Christ, have the responsibility to pray, to pray for the nations. Because in the latest statistic that I saw from the International Mission Board, There are 3.5 billion people living within people groups that have less than 2% evangelical. That means that they have very little gospel witness in their people group and have had no church planting in that people group within the past couple of years. That means there's no churches even being planted there right now. Three and a half billion people in what's commonly called unreached people groups. We have a responsibility to pray that those people would hear the good news of Jesus, that they would hear, that they would turn from their sin and turn to their only hope, Jesus Christ. Because of what we know comes to those who have not turned. We know that there is coming a judgment. And for every single person who has not trusted in Christ, that judgment leads to an eternal separation, an eternal hell, where they experience judgment for all of eternity. And so we are called to pray that they would hear and that they would believe. And to pray that God would raise up workers who would go to those peoples to pray for the few Christians who are there that they might boldly stand for Christ, that they might not be swayed by the opposition and persecution that often comes. We have the responsibility, those of us who are in Christ, to give for the cause of missions. This is the time of year where we emphasize the Lottie Moon Christmas offering, an offering that goes to support worldwide mission where every dollar goes to those missionaries who are on the field. Because we know that we need to get people to these difficult places. And so we have the responsibility to give, whether we're able to give little or able to give very much for the advancement of the gospel. And then there's the responsibility to go. You know, all of us have the responsibility to go to those who are near us, those who are within our sphere of influence to share the good news of Jesus Christ with them. But there are some who will go to far away places 
to share the good news of Christ. Because they know that unless someone goes, there will be people who die without ever even hearing the good news of Jesus Christ. Those of us who stay, we will support those who go. We will encourage them. We will pray for them. We will provide for them. We will do everything we can to support them. But there will be some of us. There will be some who hear the story of the unreached people groups. And for them, it won't be just another story about a group across the world that they hear. They won't be able to let that story go. They won't be able to just hear the facts and then move on about their life. They'll think of the men and women who are in those people groups who are on their way to an eternal hell. They'll think about the boys and girls who are growing up without ever hearing the name of Jesus. They'll almost be able to see the pictures of the faces of those kids and those adults, and they won't be able to get it out of their mind. They'll almost be able to hear the desperate need of those who are running toward hell, and they don't even realize it, and they won't be able to let it go. But they won't just hear in their mind the voices of those who are so far away from Christ. They'll hear at the same time the call of the Spirit telling them to go, telling them to lay aside everything that they have, to leave it all for something that is worthwhile worthy of laying their lives down even for the cause of Jesus Christ. I wonder this morning if there aren't some in this room who that applies to, who you have thought so often of those who are far away and who don't know Christ and don't even have a possibility of knowing Christ, and you can't get it out of your mind. And maybe you've been hearing the voice of the Spirit as well, bringing conviction to you and saying, will you go? Go. Go to those who need. And I wonder if there are some in here this morning who the Spirit has been working that way in your life to lead you to go and lay everything else aside. Whether that's you, or whether it's God calling you and speaking to you about staying here and going to those around you. Every single one of us have a responsibility for the gospel going to the ends of the world. Through going or supporting those who go. So I wonder this morning as we think about Jesus coming, lying in a manger, then going to a cross, and then a global mission. How is it the Lord is working in your life for you to be a part of his global purpose for the gospel going to the ends of the earth? Let's pray. God, we give praise to you, thanks to you for your great goodness, your holiness, for Christ coming. God, I pray that you would help us to think this morning beyond the manger to the cross, to the peoples all around the world who need the good news of Jesus. Help us to think, what is it that you would have us do, Lord? How would you use us for your global glory. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. This morning we're going to sing a song of invitation that deals specifically with mission. If the Lord is dealing with you in any particular way, I invite you to come and speak to me or to Pastor Douglas. We'll be down here at the front. You respond as the Lord is leading you to this morning. If you, if you would, stand as we sing this morning.
For the cause of Christ the King, we give our lives and offering till all the earth resounds with ceaseless praise to the Son. For the cause of Christ we go with joy to into the commissioning. I want to share just a few uh, quick things with you. Um, you have heard me already mention the uh, choir presentation tonight, so you already know that you need to be here tonight at 6 for that. Um, we do have a couple of uh, groups that are joining with us this morning. And so we have uh, Richard and Ann Choate and Elijah here. If you would stand up. They are coming to join with us as members. If you would welcome them, uh, do so this morning saying amen. Thank you. And then also, Sammy Bakir is here. Uh, he is joining, and you can stand so they can see who you are. Uh, if you would welcome him uh, as a member here at First Baptist, please do so now. You may, you may be seated. And they'll be here after the service where you can greet them. And just a couple of quick things that you need to be aware of. Um, we are going to next Sunday be voting at the end of the service on a couple of things. Uh, one is the uh, slate of 2024 term deacons, and you can see that list there in your bulletin. Uh, and then also, uh, next Sunday, we will be voting at the end of the service on members of our capital campaign team. 
Uh, you heard me uh, mention that, and we had some discussion about that team uh, a few weeks ago when we had the Tour 200 presentation. Uh, those team members are mentioned there. Uh, Jerry and Luann Powell serving as co-chairs, uh, Jack Holmes, Lauren Kennedy, Ron Kirkland, Neil Rager, and Terry Swindle, uh, in addition to a few ex-officios, the senior pastor, uh, the church administrator, John David, and the finance committee chair for each year. Uh, and so we will be voting on that at the end of next Sunday. If you do happen to have any questions about that team, what they will be doing, uh, you can come talk to me or our chair of finance, uh, and then we will, uh, David Craig over here, uh, and then we'll also have Wednesday night a few minutes set aside for any questions that you might have at this prayer meeting uh, this coming Wednesday. Uh, their task is very simple, just to, to uh, look to see what our capital needs are and then bring a presentation to the church about how we go about meeting that, the amount and the length of time. So a fantastic group, very thankful for them and the work that they're going to do. But this morning, we do have something incredibly important for us as a church. Unusually special event where we come to a commissioning. So Pastor Douglas, would you come and lead us in that? There is a letter written by Andrew Fuller, who is an 18th century pastor, and this letter was to his friend and missionary partner, William Carey, and he was describing the relationship between their church and the one that their church had sent out. And I believe this letter has become quite well known to most of you, but I will read a short portion of it again. Fuller says this, our undertaking to India really appeared to me on its commencement to be somewhat like a few men who were deliberating about the importance of penetrating into a deep mine which had never before been explored. We had no one to guide us. And while we were thus deliberating, Carey, as it were, said, well, I will go down if you will hold the rope. Church, that is the way that I want us to think about missions. There are some who are miners who go down into the pit, and that's what miners are going to be doing. And the rest of us should be saying to this, them this morning, if you go down, we will hold the rope. We'll be here as a source of encouragement and support for them, and that we will be here as a reminder that Christ is with them. As your church family, we want to say to you this morning that we love you, we thank God for you, and selfishly, we would love to keep you here. But for the sake of those in foreign lands who need to hear about Jesus and for the hope that is found in him, we will gladly send you out. We send you out with joy and with love and our full-throated support. We send you out with hope and with confidence because we believe in the power of the gospel to save sinners. If you guys could come up to the front, let everybody see you. Um, we do want to send you out, but we don't want to send you out empty-handed. So we have a few gifts, that way you can remember us whenever you go. As Paul requested that Timothy would send him his books and a copy of the scriptures while he was on the mission field, we wanted to send you out with some books and a copy of the scriptures. Now, we've gotten each of you a book that will pertain to your specific area of ministry as well as a bag to carry them in. I hate to break this to you. The bag that we got for you is somewhere over the Indian Ocean right now. So <laughs> hopefully that will get here before you guys get on the plane. Um, you can take mine in, in the meantime. We've gotten you a set of um, that have been designed to display the gospel story. As you work, may this be a tool to open doors and open hearts. We've also gotten you guys some mugs with our names on them. That way you don't forget who we are when you go overseas. 
We've gotten you a book, one for uh, youth ministry for you, and one with various stories of women of the faith for you. We've also gotten you a copy of the scriptures. May you begin to hide this particular version of God's word in your heart. May it flow freely from you when you carry the light to those in darkness. And as with all of our missionaries, we send you out with a piece of rope. That way you will be reminded that we as your church will be holding the rope for you. Church, here in just a moment, we are going to gather around this dear couple and pray over them and send them off. Um, For those in the balcony, it may take you a little while to get down here, so if you want a head start, you can go ahead. And I know you are here as well. You guys get a free pass to come up first. What we have read this morning already in Acts chapter 13, it tells us that the church in Antioch, before they sent out Paul and Barnabas on that very first missionary journey, that the church gathered around them, laid hands on them, and prayed over them. So we will be doing that this morning. And then everyone else, get as close as you can. I realize that uh, we've got quite a lot going on up here on the stage this morning, but let us gather around, get as close as you can to put a hand on these, and then we will pray for them. Heavenly Father, we pray to you through your Son, Jesus Christ, that your glory would go forth and that your Holy Spirit would work in the hearts of men and women on the other side of the planet for the sake of your great name. We pray that you would go before these two that you would make straight their paths, that you would already begin to work in the hearts and lives of those with whom they will come in contact, drawing them to yourself, making them fertile soil for the gospel which will be planted by these two. Father, I pray for them that you would give them courage, that you would give them skill, that you would give them grit and toughness. Father, I pray for their language acquisition. I pray that they would begin to think and speak and dream and evangelize. I pray for their culture acquisition, that they would begin to have a heart for this people that is made in your image and is separated from you because of their sin. I pray that you would make steadfast in their soul the truths of the gospel, that they wouldn't, that they wouldn't waver, Father, even as they see ugly things, even as they see horrible things, even as they go toe-to-toe with the forces of evil, may they lean on Jesus. Father, go before them and use them. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. And our benediction this morning will come from those final words of the book of Matthew, which Scott already read to us, where Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. You are dismissed.